Uh, good evening, all, and good morning, Jonathan. Um, welcome to a webinar on fish cognition organized by the Federation of Indian Animal Protection Organizations, known as FIAPO, New Delhi. The aim of this webinar is to explore and learn about the intellectual and cognitive abilities of fishes and their sentient nature. We know that animals are sentient beings. Some animals like dogs, cows, express behavior that we easily recognize as happy or sad. But we understand very little about fish cognition. Many questions may come up in your mind, like do fish feel happy or sad? Do they feel fear and distress? You may get all these answers in today's webinar, where Dr. Jonathan Balcom is going to share his knowledge, experiences. Dr. Jonathan is a reputed scientist, author, and speaker. He is a biologist with PhD in animal ethology. He has published more than 60 scholarly papers and book chapters. He taught a course in animal sentience for the World is Graduate Institute and Human Society University. His books include Pleasurable Kingdom, Second Nature, The Exultant Ark, one of the New York Times bestseller book, What a Fish Knows, and recently published Superfly. We welcome Dr. Jonathan and request him to throw some lights on this new but very interesting subject. I also request Jonathan to display his bestseller books and recently published book to the participants who may want to dwell deeper into the topic of fish cognition. I would like to uh, announce for the participant that this, they can put their questions or they ask their questions in the question and answer box instead of chat. We will pick the relevant questions and clarify them at the end of the presentation. Your videos and audios are disabled for this webinar. If you have any questions, please put them into the question and answer section, or you can email later on to Jonathan. Now I'm handing over to Jonathan. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dinesh, and thank you to Tanu for reaching out to me. Um, as I was saying to them a few minutes ago, it's wonderful that I can present to you today uh, without leaving my home in Belleville, Ontario, the other side of the world. It's, of course, lovely to travel, and I've had the good fortune of visiting India uh, on two occasions. Um, but also, it's it's good for the planet and 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 good for the economy that I can do this from here. So, Denise asked me to show my books. Um, the fish book looks like this in one edition, but there's also another English edition that looks like that. So, I don't know which ones show up in India, but uh, and here's what uh, the cover of the Superfly book looks like. This is the one that just came out uh, a month ago, exactly a month ago. And maybe in another occasion, I can talk to you about insects. OK, I'm going to share the screen now so I can uh, go through my slides with you. Can everybody see the opening slide? Yes, yes. Good, good. Yeah. OK. All right, well, we generally think of fishes. Hang on, I'll make sure that I can get the slides to go forward. OK. We generally think of fishes in one of two contexts, or this humans do anyway, maybe not this group, but either as a source of food or a source of recreation in many parts of the world. Fishing is a very, very popular uh, activity, um, hobby. Uh, but today I want to encourage you to see fishes through a different lens. Uh, I've spent years researching uh, the lives of fishes, primarily as a synthesizer of the research that other people have done. And um, I've discovered quite amazing things that we, that scientists have, have revealed about the lives of fishes, about their sentience, their capacity to feel, their experiences, their social lives, etc. So today, in the 45 minutes or so that I'll be speaking, I'll, I'll be sharing those with you. And uh, to repeat what Denise said, if you have any questions, feel free to write them down or ask them at the end of the presentation. I will, I will be happy to stay for questions. The first thing I want to impress upon you about fishes is that they are an incredible, incredibly diverse group of animals. 
there are more species of fish in the world today than there are all the other vertebrates combined. So all the birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians combined don't make as many species as, as there are fishes. Um, minimum 33,000 species and probably several thousand more because humans discover new ones every year. There's two major groups of fishes and they're represented here by the bony fishes, which is all the ones you see with the exception of the ray near the upper left and then the shark right at the upper left corner. They are the cartilaginous fishes. And I just like to point out that they are as different evolutionarily from the bony fishes as birds are from mammals. But we generally just lump them all together and call them fish or fishes because they basically have a streamlined body form. They've evolved to move through water. So through convergent evolution, they've come to resemble each other. Although, as you can see here, there's an incredible diversity of shapes and sizes. And as we may expect with such a huge diverse group of animals, there are any number of superlatives that they, that they re represent, including perhaps the smallest vertebrate in the world is a, is a fish. There's actually another one that's since been discovered that's considerably smaller than this species, which is a little fish of the Philippine lakes. And uh, you can actually put 500 adult fish on, on one side of a scale and, a, and an American coin, suffice to say any kind of coin in India would, would do as well. And the coin will go down. Most coins weigh more than 500 adults of these species of these fish. So it says something about how very tiny they are. Uh, as I say, there's many superlatives I could mention, but time doesn't permit that. So I'll mention one more, and that is longevity. This is a Greenland shark. And as far as we know, for the time being, this is the record holder for longevity among a, in, a, in a vertebrate. These long-lived sharks swim slowly under Arctic ice. And uh, it's now known that they need to be about 135 years old before they're a breeding age. So that's when they kind of reach, get through puberty and they reach adulthood. In, a, in 135 years. And there are some sharks still probably swimming under the ice who were swimming when Shakespeare was writing his, play, his plays back in the 1600s. These animals can live to 400 plus years. So they're remarkably long lived. You can only imagine what kind of wisdom they may accumulate in that time. I want to say a few things about sentience of fishes, of course, very an important subject, the capacity to feel being sentience. And um, I can tell you that right off the bat that fishes are full members of the vertebrate group. They have all the same characteristics. They have the same 10 body systems that we have and that other mammals and birds have. They um, have three kinds of nociceptors. These are pain receptors uh, that, that, that are activated by chemical heat or mechanical pain signals and they send signals to the brain and the fish responds in an adaptive way. So if the fish is injured in the mouth, the fish is not going to feed for a while. They're going to not want to cause pain to that part of their body. And they become, uh, re they retreat and they don't, they become less active. So both uh, physiologically through the biochemistry that we can study and the, the anatomy of the nervous tissue and the behavior of fishes when they are injured, fits very well with an animal who not only can detect stimuli, but can actually feel painful stimuli and act accordingly. Just to give you one example of, a, of an experiment that I think very convincingly shows that fishes feel pain, scientists got about 30 of these uh, zebra fishes and they put them in a complex tank with two chambers. One chamber was dimly lit with lots of places to hide, rocks and vegetation. That's the kind of place that little fish like this like to be. But if they wanted, they could swim across to the other chamber, which was brightly lit with nowhere to hide. And they avoided that. All the fish stayed in the first chamber. And that continued to be the case after some of them were injected with an acid, which would cause pain. And the others were the control group were injected with a saline solution, which would not cause any lasting pain. Um, and they all stayed in the first chamber. And then the scientists put some painkiller, lidocaine in this case, in the water of the other chamber. And lo and behold, after that, some of the fishes began swimming across. And it was only the ones who had received the acid injection, the ones who'd received the relatively benign saline solution, remained in the safe tank. Uh, the other ones, however, realized they could get pain relief over here, so they went there. So that to me shows that not only do these fish have the wherewithal to seek out pain relief, but they also are willing to pay a cost to do that. 
they're willing to make a sacrifice to actually swim in a dangerous area. I find that to be a very convincing way of demonstrating pain in, a, in an animal. It would be nice for those of us who, are, who believe in the humane treatment of animals, it'd be nice if we didn't feel the need to do these studies. Unfortunately, there's still an, a lot of people, including scientists and many fishermen, who like to believe that fishes don't feel pain. Well, the science refutes that quite strongly. A little bit about fish cognition, how do fishes think? Tool use is one of the many things on, a, on what used to be a long list of uniquely human attributes that now we now know many animals possess. And even fishes, despite the fact that they don't have grasping hands, they showed tool use behavior. This tusk fish on the right, before this photo was taken, and you can watch examples of this on YouTube, had used water as a tool to blow water on the sand to uncover a, a, a mollusk, a, a clam in this case, then picks the clam up and with what looks like pretty, pretty much planning and intent, swims to a particular piece of coral or rock, and then with a series of well-timed and well-coordinated head flicks and releases, is able to smash this unfortunate clam against the rock to get at the tissue inside. Note also a number of bystanders, or I guess by swimmers, a number of other fish on the left who are watching the action, opportunistically waiting for an opportunity to get some of the spoil spoils. These are alert, aware, uh, intelligent creatures. So tool use is definitely on the list of fish's many accomplishments. What about memory? Uh, so often people think that fishes don't have a very good memory. Maybe that's just a bias because some of them are very small, such as this frill-finned goby who just only grows to about four or five inches long and lives at the, uh, along the Atlantic coastline. Well, it looks can be deceiving because this animal has an excellent memory and can in fact do some things with their memory that we cannot. I can tell you, I certainly can't. They live in the intertidal zone in this kind of habitat. At low tide, there's these ponds and people had noticed that these fishes are able to jump accurately from one tide pool to another to escape a predator such as an octopus or a heron or what have you. It raises the question, how do they know which way to jump and how far? How, how do they avoid ending up stranded on the rocks after making a leap of faith? It turns out that they make they memorize the intertidal zone at high tide. So when the water comes in a few hours later, they swim around the nooks and crannies and they make a, what's called a mental map. They learn that topography and they know when the tide recedes again, they know where the tide pools will be. A pretty remarkable skill in itself. And a series of captive studies done in, in New York City of all places over several years found that they could memorize a tide pool zone in one day and they could remember it 40 days later, despite being put in some other tank and having no experience with it in the meantime. So they have a long, these are long-term memories. They're sophisticated memories. It's a beautiful example of creatures being very good at what's important to them. Here's another example of tool use in the so-called archer fish. These fishes also use water as a tool. In this case, a ballistics tool. They, there's six known species of these, of these fishes and they squirt water like a gun out of a specially adapted mouth. Uh, they squirt it very accurately at insects, either perched as seen here near the water to knock them in, of course, to eat them or flying over the water. And it's been shown through the careful captive experiments that they calibrate the size of the amount of water and the force. They can squirt it about two meters uh, and they cal or three meters actually, they calibrate the force of that according to the size and speed, et cetera, of the insect flying over. And if the insect is further away, they squirt ahead using like a predictive tracking uh, strategy, the way a soccer player kicks a soccer ball or a cricketer may throw a ball to somebody who's running. I don't know if they do that in cricket, but anyway, um, but I can tell you that is a cricket in this photograph. But um, but if the insect is flying closer to the water, they actually rotate their body and squirt water at the same time. So they use at least two different te techniques to catch, catch insects. Of course, it assumes the insect doesn't change path. Uh, and apparently they're quite good at identifying different kinds of insects, because as I said earlier, they control the shape and size and speed of the water squirt the jet according to the, the characteristics of the insect who's there. 
It's also been shown they learn by observation that they can learn the skill without having any practice themselves. And if they've been able to watch, say, a thousand examples from other fishes doing this, and then they get their first chance, they do better than if they hadn't been able to watch any other fish. Learning by observation is, is considered to be a quite le high level of cognitive skill. And because archer fishes, as in the panel on the right, can squirt water at objects above them, scientists have realized, hey, well, let's present them with touch pads and put stimuli on those. And so they've been, they're a very good subject for studying things like face recognition. People who've kept fishes in aquariums have often claimed that they can be, that their fishes recognize them specifically because they're the ones who feed them. And now we know it's true, at least in this species and probably many others. Even if you take the hair away is on the left or, and even the ears, these fishes are able to recognize a familiar face among 30 or 40 other faces. So face recognition, they have very good visual skills. We should expect this of a fish who's squirting water at insects outside the, the water that requires very good vision. Another visual phenomenon that fishes show is the so-called face inversion effect. If you present a, a face of a familiar fish, such as the one on the right, who's been flipped upside down, the fish on the left has difficulty recognizing that fish. Same thing for us. We have difficulty recognizing an up -down, upside down face. Chimpanzees, however, are quite good at it. And once again, this probably relates to their own natural history. If it's something that they are exposed to and they get practice in, they're probably gonna be better at it than we are. I was also intrigued to learn that fishes of many species have been tested in so-called optical illusions, such as this Ebbinghaus illusion in which both of the orange dots are the same size in actuality, but because of the arrangement of blue dots around them, the one on the right looks larger than the one on the left. You can, you can train fishes to touch their nose against the larger two circles when presented, give them a food reward for touching the right one. They like to get it right because they get some food. And then if you present them with this in a randomized fashion, they will always go up to the one that's surrounded by the small blue dots, the one that looks larger and poke their nose against that. I think that's quite poignant. It shows that a fish can have beliefs and that those beliefs can be fallible. It's quite, uh, quite human of them, if you like. It says, it shows that they experience things and they perceive things and they, and they as I say, they have beliefs. And I think that's something to be worth being aware of. Quite recently, just, well, a couple of years ago, a study was published showing that fishes, in this case, blue striped cleaner wrasses, very small fish, but a very important one in reefs, that they appear to recognize themselves in a mirror. This would be an example of self-awareness, and that too is considered a high-level cognitive trait. Uh, until that study was published, the only other animals to show this were great apes, elephants, dolphins and whales, and a bird, in this case, a, a European magpie. I must add one other more though that really makes you scratch your head and that is ants. There's a study of ants published a couple of years earlier than this one in which the ants, when seeing uh, a red dot painted on their forehead, they looked at themselves in the mirror, they groomed it, they went up, they, they acted very differently than if it was a black dot that they couldn't see or, or a dot on the back of the head, a, a series of experiments. So, you know, I, I, think, I think the point here is we need to stop being presumptuous about what we think animals can do. Because if we look more closely, we find that they do pretty remarkable things. In this case, the scientists put a, a gel dot, uh, I believe it was on the chin of the fish, and then trained them to get used to, to be interacting with a mirror. And then when they put the dot on, the fish seemed to be observing the dot and would go and swim and try and scrape it off on the bottom and come back and look. So they appear to be recognizing that what that fish is in the mirror is a reflection of themselves and not another fish. Another quite sophisticated behavior in fishes is referential communication and, and collaborative hunting. And this happens between two large species on reefs, the one on the top being a grouper and the one on the bottom being, a, in this case, a green moray eel. You may actually be able to see a little cleaner wrasse on each of them there doing some cleaning, removing parasites. I'll get to that shortly. Actually, I just noticed there's one in the grouper's mouth too at the corner of the mouth. 
Uh, I don't know if I have, a, I have a pointer that you can see, but you probably can find that. Anyway, that's not quite the central point uh, of this particular slide. I just wanted to explain to you that these two species in the Red Sea and probably some other locations, they actually uh, engage in collaborative hunting. And the way it works is the grouper invites the moray eel and I'm sure this is not just any moray eel, it's probably a particular eel they know, they know where they live in the reef and they've worked with them before. And they invite them with a head shake. And in some cases they do a whole body, body shimmy. And this invites the, the moray eel to come foraging with, with me. So it's an invitation. If the moray is hungry and in the mood, off they swim together. And again, you can watch YouTube videos of this, this remarkable behavior. And the way it works, of course, is that a, a poor fish who they target, if the fish escapes into the matrix of the reef, well, the moray eel is very slender and can chase that fish in there. If the moray doesn't catch the fish, him or herself, then and the fish flees into the open water, well, you know who's waiting on the outside, the big big fast swimming grouper fish. And it's estimated that they have a up to five, five times greater success rate at catching fish when they hunt together. So and it's an example of referential communication because the head shake is referring to an event later in time and in a different space. It's, it's a referential thing, it's referring. The groupers will also do a, a head down pointing gesture. If a fish escapes into the reef, if the moray eels nearby, they'll point down sort of to essentially call them over. They may even swim over and try and bring them back. So it's a very conscious, aware um, cooperation. And follow-up studies in captivity at uh, Cambridge University find that fake moray eels who are in laminated in plastic that can be controlled by pulleys so the scientists can make them come out and help or not come out and not be helpful show that groupers remember a, a helpful and cooperative one the next day and they will just shun one who's not cooperative. So once again, this is not just willy-nilly any old moray eel. It's a particular moray eel who they've had success with in the past. Now onto the cleaner wrasses that I showed you earlier in the mirror self-recognition study. They are very important on the reef because they perform a service. It's, a, it's one of the most complex and well-studied mutualisms or symbioses among vertebrate animals. The pufferfish here is a so-called client and there's more than a hundred known client species, including, including sea turtles and sharks, etc. And the client fishes typically wait their turn uh, and then when it's their turn, they swim up and they are serviced by these uh, by these cleaner wrasses, two in this case. And the, the clients cooperate. They open their mouths. This is a predatory fish. This fish could easily eat one of these and have dinner, but it's not a very good strategy for maintaining good business relationships to eat your business partner. So they don't do that. Instead, they cooperate. You know, here you go, go in my mouth, clean out these parasites that are in there. Here's my gill cover, you know, swim in and out of there because these parasites sometimes latch onto the gills and they interfere with proper respiration for the fish. They want to be rid of them. And you can see it's a mutualism because clearly the client fish benefits by, by losing parasites, but also the cleaner fishes benefit by eating them and getting food, getting morsels of food. But it is Machiavellian. It's more complex than that. Sometimes the cleaner wrasses don't do as good a job at cleaning. They may mucus nip, for instance, where they actually bite a little moat of some of that slimy outer layer on the fish, which is a good protective layer. And the client fish doesn't like that. They may jolt and uh, it's been found that the cleaner wrasses are more likely to do a shoddy job if there are fewer other client fishes waiting in the queue. It's as if they're aware that their eBay ratings are gonna go down if they behave poorly. So they will either do a better job if there's more, more in the queue and or they may mollify clients by fl fluttering their pectoral fins against their body to give them a little caress. Uh, that's a very interesting behavior in its own right because it suggests that, that being touched and stroked gently is pleasurable for fishes. More on that shortly. What about artistry in fishes? Um, it appears to be the case that female fishes of this species at least um, have an appreciation for art and design because this structure here, which is about six feet wide and is uh, off the coast of Japan was only discovered a few years ago, is done by a previously undescribed very small puffer fish, only about four inches long or so, 10 centimeters or so, who spends days building and maintaining this structure by swimming and fluttering his fins in a certain way and creates this beautiful piece of art. And if a female is duly impressed by this artwork, they will mate, lay eggs in the center, cover them with 
bits of sand and gravel and eggs, it's not eggs, sorry, with seashells, which they will crush in their, in their teeth and sprinkle over it, uh, presumably to protect the eggs. Although I don't know quite why it works so well because it looks like a big invitation that to, it's breakfast time for anyone who eats fi fish eggs, but it evolved this way. So it clearly works. And it does very clearly give an example of a sexually selected trait where generations of females who are very choosy and tend to favor males with very good artistic skills, uh, drive the evolution of this elaborate nesting behavior. So uh, evolution can give life, give, give rise to artistic excellence among other species, not just humans. Here's an example of virtue in fishes. And I think there are many examples. I'll give you a couple. These are four different species of rabbit fishes. These are um, vegetarian fishes that live on the reef. They feed on algae. And uh, isn't it nice if you can have somebody keeping an eye out while you feed more safely? Because if you feed on algae, you have to get your head down in the reef and you're not as alert to perhaps a moray eel or a grouper or heaven forbid both coming to, to try and catch you. So here you can see that, that these fishes solve this problem by having working in pairs and having a lookout who foregoes feeding, hence a virtuous behavior, it's, it's delayed gratification, and instead looks up and looks around and keeps an eye on things so that the, the partner can feed relatively safely in the reef. Of course, as you probably can guess, they switch places shortly after this, this photo was taken for each of them so that the one who was feeding can come up and play lookout while the other one feeds. So everybody gets food in a more safe manner thanks to this self-sacrificial virtuous behavior. Here's a still photograph from a, a video of uh, a feeding frenzy, quote unquote. I put it in quotes because I don't really like the phrase feeding frenzy. It, it suggests that there's no control and it's get what you can and, and uh, you know, better get out of the way because you might get bitten. And indeed this shark on the right just got to a chunk of food uh, just before the one on the left. And it looks like the one on the right is gonna receive a very nasty bite on the nose, and on the head. But uh, these sharks are not just frenzied, they're actually aware of each other and they're careful to try and not inj injure each other. Right after this photo was taken, right after this happened, the shark on the left quickly veered away and didn't close the mouth. He or she opened the mouth even wider and went to great trouble to avoid biting his or her comrade. So I think the, the term feeding frenzy, like so many of the things we've humans have said about sharks is a, is a misrepresentation of their behavior. What about shark stroking? There are divers such as uh, Christina Zanato on the left who I interviewed for my book, who take divers down to watch sharks and interact with them. Uh, these sharks are Caribbean reef sharks and she has names for many of them, such as an old one named grandma. And uh, they know her and she knows them. It's individual recognition and they know that she will give them a nice massage, she'll give them a nice petting session. So they will literally swim up to her and rest their heads on her lap, the ones who are more trusting and courageous perhaps, and uh, she pets them. And many divers, a growing number of divers use this technique to calm sharks down so that they can remove fishing hooks, which often end up in the mouths of sharks, such as this blue shark here. You can see a very large hook there and you might be able to even see a, the monofilament plastic line trailing from it. It's obviously better for these animals, these sentient creatures, if they can have those, those hooks removed and divers such as Teresa Guys and her colleagues will get bolt cutters as they did in this case. Shortly after this photo was taken, they were able to remove that hook. Um, we, it raises the question as has been suggested with whales who are stuck in, in fishing nets. Are these animals aware that humans can help them and do they appreciate it? There's no real clear answer to that question yet. But the fact that these sharks will sometimes swim around divers and then will remain in the area after they've had the hook taken out suggests that perhaps they are aware that A, divers can help them and B, they feel gratitude for the help that they've received. Their brains are quite big. These are long lived animals. We should be very open to these possibilities. We certainly know that animals feel stress and we know that fishes are included in that group. You can measure stress in a fish by taking a blood sample and usually scientists do it by taking a, a small sample with a needle from the tail vein, which is the narrow part just anterior to the tail. And if you find high levels of cortisol, a stress hormone in there, 
you can conclude that that fish is quite upset. And it's not surprising that a fish who's caught in their home, in this case, the Great Barrier Reef, and these are striated uh, surgeon fishes, that when they're captured and taken out of their habitats, they're going to be very stressed. If you put them in a bucket of shallow water for 30 minutes, they'll be even more stressed. And that's what these scientists from the University of Lisbon did in this study of stress and stress relief. What I find most remarkable about this study is that when they offered them the opportunity to de-stress, to lower their stress through who would have guessed through being stroked and petted by, in this case, a mechanical fake, but very realistic looking blue stripe cleaner rash, rash attached to a motor in the top of the slide that caused that rash to swim, to sweep backwards and forward and it could give caresses. The stressed individual fish on the in the treatment at the top where that model was moving would swim up to it and get caresses and their stress levels based on the blood measurements would drop back to baseline. And on average, the ones in the top treatment where they could get caresses, they visited that cleaner fish model 15 times per hour. In the control treatment, the one on the bottom where there was no moving cleaner ras, it was just stationary because there was no motor to move it. Uh, they visited it an average of zero times per hour. They didn't spend any time with it at all. They couldn't get any caresses. And not surprisingly, perhaps their stress levels remained high. So this study, shows that fishes not only get stressed, but they will take action to relieve stress through being caressed. Um, and if they and, and their stress levels will come down in that situation. And if they're unable to do that, their stress levels don't come down nearly as quickly. I find that a, a very a quite remarkable finding. And uh, I'm also happy to say that all of the surgeon fishes uh, survived the study and they were released back into their original homes in the Great Barrier Reef. And here you have a wild fish on the right, uh, in this case, a Nassau grouper approaching a trusted diver to be stroked, to be petted. Uh, they like it. They're not getting any food in this situation. They're simply getting the pleasure of being petted by somebody who they know and trust. This diver on the left sent me this photo and she's met this particular Nassau grouper many times. I spoke to a vet school in Kansas a few years ago and showed that slide and another student came up and said, oh yeah, I have pictures of my dad and, and me petting a, 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 a wild Nassau grouper. This is a wild animal. This would be a little bit like having a, a spotted deer or sandbar in India walk up to you to be petted. I mean, this is quite remarkable behavior in a wild creature. What about play? What about boredom? Um, the, because of the cognitive and emotional sophistication of these animals, uh, should we be surprised that they might feel bored if they're living alone in a tank and that they might try to relieve their boredom through interacting with something interesting, something that's not so boring? Case in point, a study of just three male cichlid fishes, as many species of cichlid, this is one kind, and there were three individual males housed in separate tanks. They had some habitat to interact with, but let's face it, no, no social, no company. It's like solitary confinement. Each male independently took to interacting with the semi-buoyant um, thermometer that was in each in, in their tank. And they would bump it around and because the thermometer would go back and forth and it would look like it was trying to bump them back, they could avoid that. It was entertaining and each fish did it in a different way. One of them would, would box it in a, around the middle, one would box it around the top, another one would put, pin it against the corner of the tank. So it, it was concluded based on a very academic set of criteria for what's considered to be play behavior, it was considered that it was play behavior. And I would also add that it was probably bo boredom relief, that, that fishes can get bored, and this is a way to relieve boredom. Well, our relationship with fishes has been a very poor one, a very troubled one. And some of the reasons for this, I believe, is that we're kind of more alienated from them than the other vertebrates. Not, not to say that we've been exactly kind to other vertebrates, but uh, fishes have particularly been ill-treated in very large numbers. And I think part of that is that we, until recently, haven't been able to really observe them and to study them up close. And some of the questions that scientists are asking now were not being asked before. So people had no idea, you know, we had no idea of how, how sophisticated they actually were. And we probably have only begun to scratch the surface given that we've only studied a small fraction of those 33 plus thousand species of fish. I'm sure they're very happy about that. Consider that 
also that they don't blink, you know, they don't show and they don't vocalize. Well, they do vocalize, but they vocalize underwater and their their sounds in the air are about as effective as us sticking our head in the water and shouting to some somebody standing next to us. They're not going to hear us. They're not going to say what we're know what we're saying. So they do communicate vocally many species and some of them are even named for this, such as grunts and sea robins and the like toad fishes. Uh, but we're not tuned into that. And so it's only recently we've been able to uh, delve more deeply into their lives and realize that just how much complexity is going on in their minds and in their bodies, that they actually don't just live their, they experience lives. They don't just have biology, they have biographies. Sadly, because of our activities, because of how many humans there are, and because of the depredations we have against fishes, we've seen large losses of numbers. And if you know anything about the history of commercial fishing, you'll know that there a lot there'd been a lot of decline before 1970 as well. And there are a number of very serious threats to fishes, their populations and their habitats, including, of course, climate change, which is linked to human numbers and human industry and pollution. Uh, changing levels of acid, ocean acidification, where the, the oceans are becoming less alkaline and more acidic, which is disruptive to them. And this is probably related, both of those causes are related to uh, and behind this phenomenon of coral bleaching, where corals are losing their, their integrity. Uh, they have a symbiotic relationship with algae, but they're casting out the algae as the waters get warmer and more polluted and perhaps more acidic as well. And then the insidious problem of ocean plastics, most of it being lost or discarded fishing gear, which uh, World Animal Protection estimated in a study a few years ago amounts to about 640,000 tons of fishing gear lost or discarded by humans every year. And some of it washes up on beaches, but a lot of it also continues to float out in the ocean where it continues to wreak havoc on fish populations who get trapped in these old nets and weigh them down until they eventually sink to the bottom. It's a very uh, nasty problem. And then uh, an, a, a relatively hidden problem that's hard to see, but if you study it closely, it's very much there is microplastics, tiny plastic beads, which happen to resemble fish eggs. And so little predatory fish like this pike will consume them, but of course they cannot digest them and uh, that causes them to die. Um, these microplastics occur in the quintillions now in some bodies of water in the world. So very, very, very large numbers of them. I often like to ask this question to audiences, particularly young audiences. I spoke to some little children recently at a school nearby. I was of course on Zoom, not in the classroom, given that we're in the pandemic. And I like to ask them this question and, and they may say things like guns and knives and such like that, which are fair candidates. But I think the leading candidate is, is this, this thing here because this is what we use to put things in our mouths. And it's the decisions we make about what we eat that affect the most animals. Uh, approximately 98% of all animals that humans kill in the world are killed to be eaten. So if we're addressing all these other issues when ignoring dietary choices, we're not getting it done. And it, it's only crude estimates can be made of the number of fishes that humans um, kill each year because it's measured in weight. It's hundreds of millions of tons. Uh, it's usually in the region of about 100 million tons a year. And the only reason that number is not going up anymore is because uh, the populations cannot sustain any higher numbers. And as you probably may know, many fish populations that are commercially fished are in very deep decline and under serious threat. And another part of fishing that needs to be mentioned is, is that it's so wasteful. This is a close-up photograph of a shrimping net from uh, a boat in Tanzania. And this is typical of what you'll see in shrimping nets. Not many shrimp and a lot of other animals who are dying in that net um, is what we call bycatch. And it's estimated that humans produce 20, sorry, 200 million pounds of bycatch every year. This is dead and dying ocean life that uh, was not targeted by the fishermen and is routinely discarded over the side of the boat. So it's a terribly wasteful, not to mention cruel way of killing animals. And let's not get any ideas that aquaculture, which is the fastest growing sector of food production, is any really any better for, for these creatures. 
this photograph actually doesn't show it as bad as it can be. These animals are these animals are crowded into unnatural sea pens or in, in inland uh, facilities where they can't migrate, they can't choose mates, they have a lot of parasites often. And for that reason, pesticides and other chemicals are used. It's a very competitive situation trying to feed. Perhaps not surprisingly, um, in some operations, a lot of fishes don't are not, unable to cope with the stresses, the constant stresses. These two young salmon are the same age, but the one on the bottom is what's called a dropout, which is very common in the salmon aquaculture industry. And a dropout has essentially just become overstressed. You can measure that stress hormone cortisol, it's very high, and they give up. They're unable to cope, and so they stop eating. They lose weight, of course, as you can see here, and they eventually just float to the top uh, and die. And it's estimated that perhaps 30%, I think they say in the industry, 30% dropouts in a population is an acceptable number. So we're talking very, very large numbers of fishes. And the scientists from Norway who published this study concluded, and I quote, that these so-called dropouts are severely depressed. That's the term they used in their published article. A generation ago, I can tell you, when I was a graduate student, you would never be able to get away with suggesting that a fish could feel severely depressed. So that's encouraging. That shows that we are making progress in our ability to come to grips with the reality that these creatures are experiencing. And let's not just conclude that it's just bad for the fish. Um, commercial fishing can be very bad for humans as well. Uh, in particular parts of Asia, uh, there's a, a big problem with um, um, having essentially slaves, you know, unpaid laborers, often underage, on these boats for months. These boats don't need to go into shore because other boats can come out and offload their catch and take it somewhere and, and send it for processing. So these boats are often out there for a long period. I don't know if anyone in this group has seen the new film Sea Spiracy, but there are some interviews um, with some of these individuals who were stuck on these boats for 10 years and uh, talking about their, their ill treatment. And they're anonymous because it's there's some danger. They're endangering their lives by commenting on this. They could be exposed to retribution from those who run these, these um, slavery operations for fishing. I'm almost done now, um, but I wanna just finish coming back to the whole food matter. And that is at least for some of us living in so-called developed nations, uh, there are more and more choices becoming available for eating food that is essentially like seafood, but it isn't, doesn't come from a shrimp, it doesn't come from a fish. Uh, this product, for instance, from White Wave Foods, the one I just showed you a picture of, uh, they make these shrimp products. I tasted one about four years ago when I was in California. I hadn't eaten shrimp in a long time, but I have to say it was very palatable. It tasted very good to me, it tasted what my recollection of shrimp pretty much was. Uh, and these, these, these foods are now becoming available on the market. Unfortunately, they're still kind of expensive. Uh, it's much more expensive ultimately to produce animal food. So it's my hope that these, these, these products will become competitive in a price manner and that people will continue and increase choosing them. And there is a very, very significant change, very significant increase in companies such as this who are developing, in this case, cell-based, uh, products where you actually use fish cells, but you don't have to kill fishes. You don't have to go and catch them in nets or have aquaculture operations to make those products. It's also cleaner, therefore, obviously more humane. These, is, these are different companies that are doing this. Blue Nalo is starting to roll out uh, lab-grown tuna products that never involved a real tuna being gaffed and killed in a net. And here in Canada and in the United States, I don't know if this is available in India, I suspect not, but I do suspect that there are products that are gonna be coming out in, in that part of the world as well. Gardein is very widespread. Most supermarkets now have these products and uh, I've had these fishless fillets many times and they're not health foods by any stretch, but they're very delicious and they're a viable option for people to eat. There's a real revolution in plant-based meats happening in this part of the world, I can tell you that. As I talk to you, I can look at a sports bar less than 100 meters from my door. And uh, for two or three years now, they've had Beyond Burgers available on their menu. So people can go in there and instead of ordering a hamburger or a steak, they can order a, a plant-based burger that is very delicious and uh, not healthy, which kind of maybe that's 
part of the point is it's people don't always eat because it's healthy something so there are options available now and uh, that's just very important because unfortunately people are a bit selfish and if they don't feel like they have a good choice uh, then they make make poor choices so there are growingly more good choices that people can have so to finish up we need a better relationship with fishes. What we now know about them indicates that they are full members of the vertebrate group, that they are sentient, cognitive, emotional, aware, virtuous, vulnerable, the list goes on. And uh, I believe in karma, I like the idea that what goes around comes around, that uh, kindness and goodness are indivisible, cruelty is indivisible, um, I much prefer the kindness approach to life, being good to others. And if we're good to animals, if we have better relationships with them, I'm absolutely convinced that we'll have better relationships with each other as well. And you not only need to turn on the world news to know that there's a plenty of space for improving human relations with other humans, not to mention animals. So the, the kind of place I'd like to live in is the latter one where we're, where we're good to animals and we're good to each other. Thanks very much. I'll be happy to take some questions. Thank you, Jonathan, for the wonderful presentation and beautiful, along with the beautiful pictures. And uh, we came to know that fishes are uh, have sentiment, sentience. They feel pain and how they seek out pain relief. We also learned that they are the intelligent creatures and they, are, they have sophisticated memories and they have predictive tracking abilities also. So we learned many things from this presentation. And I think this is a time to uh, take some questions or, yeah, there is one question. Are there any sentience and cognition studies on fish species that are raised for food and large scale like car fishes? I don't know if anyone's done any studies on the fishes actually in the aquaculture operations with regards to sentience and cognition. But I can tell you that, that some fishes who are grown in aquaculture operations, there have been scientific studies on them, including the, the study I mentioned with salmon, where I talked about the pain studies and the three different kinds of nociceptors. Salmon are very wide, widely raised in aquaculture operations. And um, the old view would have been that they just were run on instincts and they, they just know by instinct which river to swim to. And these are fishes who migrate to the ocean and then come back, some of them. Uh, so they do some amazing things. And because what we know about them now shows that they feel pain and stress and they're intelligent, we should conclude that it's not just an instinct, it's, it's actual uh, aware behavior that they engage in. So maybe not surprising that some scientists now conclude that they can become severely depressed in these uh, aquaculture operations. That, that phrase, depressed, the idea of depression, to me, encompasses an animal who is a who and not just an it, an animal with a biography, an animal with a mental life, an animal with a suite of emotions and experiences. Okay, thank you. And there is one more question that, what exactly is the difference between sentience and consciousness? Can a being live without one out of the two, such as oysters? Hmm. Yeah, great question. Uh, they are different concepts, sentience, the capacity to feel and conscious consciousness to be aware, to have some wherewithal to be tuned in, if you like, to your world. Um, you, you, you can't have consciousness. Well, you can't have, <laughs> let's see, let me make sure I get this in the right order. I would say that consciousness is a prerequisite for sentience. If there's no uh, conscious awareness, then there's not really sentience. Um, you know, trees are alive. Uh, as far as we know, they're not conscious in, in, a, in a kind of cognitive way. By the way, uh, trees are great. We should treat them well, if for no other reason than they are homes for animals, but also in their own right uh, and other plants as well. But, um, but whereas animals who can move around, it, be, it benefits them to be able to feel things because they can move towards or away from 
good or bad stimuli. So consciousness and sentience kind of inter, inter, are interrelated to each other. Consciousness is awareness, sentience is the capacity to feel. I hope that clarifies a little bit. Um, I guess I should say something about oysters. You know, that's a group of animals that includes, it's in the mollusks, which is a very big phylum of animals and includes octopuses and squids. And they are the leaders among invertebrates for what we what we appreciate as sentience and awareness. There's clearly consciousness in an octopus. There's clearly emotions in a nautilus. So these cephalopod mollusks um, are clearly um, sentient and aware and conscious. Oysters are their cousins. Oysters don't move around so much as adults. So uh, the jury's a little bit unclear on whether they are conscious per se. Uh, sentience, we might want to give them the benefit of the doubt until we know more about that. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. And there is one more question that, uh, do all species of uh, fish have more or less same signs of fear or stress? Unknown really, isn't it? Um, only very few fishes have been tested. Um, however, I think we should once again apply the so-called a precautionary principle where we give them the benefit of the doubt where there's reasonable doubt. And because we do now know that some fishes feel stress and pain and have awareness and consciousness and self-awareness and tool use and, and these other things that we should be kind of assuming that other fishes have some, at least some of those capacities, some of the, the very basic ones being sentience and consciousness. I would say, I would be su very surprised if any fish did not qualify for at least those characteristics, which are pretty fundamental, being sentient and being conscious and very, very useful adaptations for an animal to have. These are all vertebrate animals. They all live lives. And so we should expect those things. And until we know otherwise, and I suspect we won't know otherwise, um, we should assume that they have those characteristics. So is it is it possible to recognize these signs of stress being, uh, I mean, as a layman? Uh, as a what? As a lemon. I mean, it's funny. I don't know what that word yeah, is. Yeah, sounds like I the mean, fruit lemon. I mean, uh, a person who doesn't know much about the you know the fish. Oh, uh, lemon. Lemon, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I thought you were saying the the sour fruit lemon, uh, and now I understand as a layman. Yeah, well, uh, you know, lay lay people don't don't spend a lot of time buried in the academic scholarly literature uh, with these studies. That's why I like to write books that um, popularize this information and make it much more available to non-scientists. Uh, non-scientists are, are just as smart and they just, they just need to have things available to them because most of them aren't in the academic libraries reading these rather boring journals. So um, yeah, laymen are absolutely deserve to have this information available to them and they hopefully they can act um, accordingly to, to what they now know. I see someone asked, do they have advanced pain receptors like humans? Yeah. Yes, the uh, the nociceptors that I mentioned are very are very much the same type of cells as you find in, in mammals. And maybe that shouldn't surprise us. All creatures continue to evolve, but, but um, all terrestrial vertebrates originated from aquatic vertebrates, you know, that, that sort of the famous idea of animals starting to crawl onto land a long time ago, uh, that, that actually happened through evolution, evolutionary times. So you have a continue, continuity there. You have evolutionary continuity with ancestries who have certain characteristics and then their, their descendants have those same characteristics because they're very useful, they're retained. It's not to say that the ancestors didn't continue to evolve, they have. Fishes have been evolving for a lot longer than we have. So we could argue that they're more highly evolved if you wanna get, get um, sort of hierarchical about it, which I don't encourage. Um, is there any question from panelists? Tanu? If not, then I have a one. I have a question. Sure. Yeah. If there is a law on fish head, what should it cover on fish cognition and sentience? If there was, if there is a law. If there is a law, yeah. So what, what it should come? My ideal law would would state flat outright that uh, fishes. Uh, the, the the science shows that fishes are clearly sentient and conscious, and that we should afford them protections based on that scientific knowledge. 
and that we are doing a very poor job so far and that it's unacceptable to catch them in big nets. It's unacceptable to keep them in crowded uh, pens and, and aquaculture operations and that we should give them uh, much more respectful treatment. But then I would be the same, saying the same things about cows and pigs and chickens as well, because we're not, we're not treating them accordingly. So all of these animals deserve to be treated far, far better than, than we treat them now. Ultimately, it would be nice if we pass laws saying, um, you know, or, or policies that get people to stop eating them because that's bad for us eventually. It's, it's bad for everybody that we eat animals. It's bad for the environment. It's bad for the economy. It's bad for our health. So that's the biggest issue that needs to change. And we need policies that speak to that. Thank you. And Jonathan, there is one more question. Uh, how do the stress and pain levels compare between wild fish and fish under human captivity? Any such studies apart from the salmon depression study? Yeah, great question. I don't know the answer to that um, because one, one thing about being caught in the wild that's a positive is that you're only caught once. So although it's probably a horrible way to die in a net or on a boat deck or on a hook, at least it happens once and you were free before that. With captivity, it's a chronic situation, right? Where the fish is in that situation with crowding and all the other problems 24-7, uh, every day, every week, every month until they're slaughtered. So I have to say, if I had my choice, I would choose to be a wild fish and I'll take my chances of surviving in the wild than being in a captive situation. As to the more the crux of the question about whether there's been any study of the stress comparing the stress, uh, I don't know. I would I would hazard to say that wild fishes are going to have much less stress at any one time typically than a fish in captivity for the simple reason that they're free, they're able to do what they want. Thank you. Um, there is one more question. What is the main ingredient in fishless fish? Hmm. I'm tempted to run run to my freezer and see if I have any in there, but I don't I don't have any. I have I have a Guardian products, but uh, it's not it's not that one. I'm sorry, I can't remember. I'm trying to think what it would be. Um, a lot of plant based meat is using pea protein. Uh, soy is often used. It's a processed food though, so they do a lot of things to it. They add add things and make it salty and fatty and palatable and tasty. So, um, but um, yeah, I, I can't tell you that, but if you Google Gardein, G-A-R-D-E-I-N on online uh, and ask for the ingredients in fishless fillets, I'm sure you'll get your answer. Is there any comments or questions? Yeah, I can see there is uh, one more question. Uh, from the attendee, uh, it's like, don't dolphins and dogs also show the same traits of self-awareness pointing towards the right to sentient beings? Yes, short answer, yes, dolphins and dogs and uh, dogfish and, you know, uh, there's a lot of animals. Of course, most of them haven't been studied in great detail, but when we look closely, we find they do much more than we thought they did. Somebody asked which fish lives for a hundred years. Uh, there was just a news item last week um, that the coelacanth, this is that fish that was undiscovered. It was a, an ancient species discovered in 1938 in deep waters off the coast of South Africa. Uh, they are now known to live over a hundred years. So quite a few species of fish, sturgeons as well. I think some catfish, um, probably any number of other ones that we don't realize can live for a century or more. Somebody asked, would all these fish emotions extend to shellfish too? Well, shellfish gets back into the mollusk group, which is an invertebrate, very different group of animals. Nevertheless, common ancestry. So there's gonna be some shared biochemistry and physiology. And uh, once again, I would say, let's, let's not assume that they're incapable of having emotions. Let's try to find out more, hopefully not by harming them. I think no more questions 
from participants or panelists. Yeah. So, thank you, Jonathan, uh, for the wonderful presentation and insight in the fish cognition. And uh, we will definitely benefit it uh, by you by this information and we will be keeping in touch to more learn about fish cognition and uh, may i know how to access the books for the participants uh if you go on to any bookseller online i don't know about in india but um uh, amazon certainly has them available um but uh, there's probably other most bookstores will order a book if it's requested so that's another strategy the books are also available as ebooks my my fly book and my fish book are available as ebooks for kindles or nooks or other e-readers and also audio books they're available as well thank you thank you jonathan and thank you nice to speak to you yeah. nice, nice to get your questions yeah. as well yeah, I just would like to inform the participant that this recording of webinar will be available in week time on the uh, Piapo's uh, YouTube website, uh, YouTube YouTube site channel. Uh, anybody can access after one week time. And thank you for participating and uh, giving time. And thanks for your patience. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you all of okay. you. Thank you. Thank Be you. well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. We'll be getting your book soon. Okay. Great. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah. Now.